come and share from God's Word with us. Thank you, Brother Hal. Thank you, Pastor. It uh, would be superfluous for me to say that I'm happy to be here. Because at my age, I'm happy to be anywhere in the world, okay? <laughs> but it is a great joy to be here. Uh, I've been here a bit before a few times, but uh, it's been a good while. But uh, you folks have been supporting me for many, many years. So uh, I, I want to thank you from the depth of my heart. I don't think you've ever missed a month of support since you started supporting. And, and that is a testimony uh, to your faithfulness, and, and thank God for that. Uh, I was in Brother Hobbins' church. I forget the name of it, okay? But a few uh, months ago, and we ate in the basement. We were walking up the stairs, and there was a pretty little girl, probably five or six years old, at the top of the steps. She looked at me, and she said, uh, You look old. And I said, "Hun, the reason I look old is I am old, okay? Uh, a few months ago, I was with the Brother Joseph Curry down in Wilson, North Carolina. <laughs> Great church. We had a wonderful time. And uh, he took me out to a, a, a steak place. It, it looks like a hole in the wall, but it's the best steak I've ever eaten in my whole life. In fact, if you don't get there at 530, you might have to wait till 730 to get in. I mean, you know, it'll see about maybe 40 people at the most. And all they serve is ribeye steak, mashed potato, or, or, or baked potato, and a salad. That, that's it. Not, nothing else. Anyway, uh, we were talking there, and, and his wife said to me, she said, the brother sis said, uh, you came to our church when I was a little girl. And she said, you were old then. <laughs> So I said to her, I've been old all my life, okay? <laughs> so I, I, I got old in, in a hurry. But uh, God is doing some great things. Uh, many of you uh, texted me and wrote letters and different things and so forth when my wife passed away. And uh, from the depth of my heart, I, I, I want to thank you for that. And I, I prayed several, many, many months before Virginia went to heaven that God would let me live long enough to take care of her and uh, to be strong enough to take care of her till God took her to heaven. And he did that. And uh, uh, after she went to heaven, and I had not gone to any meetings for several months, I just uh, stayed there with her and slept in a lazy boy chair uh, right beside her hospital bed and so forth. Then I began to pray, uh, Dear Lord, let me live till I die. Now, what I meant by that was this. Uh, dear Lord, I, I'd like for you to let me live uh, and be useful to you in your work as long as I live. Now, I know that might not happen. I may be in a rest home next week, okay? Uh, you know, anything can happen so far. And I, I know I don't have any right to tell God how I'm supposed to die and so forth. But since I am his child, I do have a right to ask him. Amen. So uh, you, you pray with me. And that, that's, I told Pastor today that uh, uh, last year I preached more times in one year than any one single year of my 65 years of ministry. And uh, after Virginia went to heaven, uh, I, I'll go anywhere. I'll eat with anybody. I'll go anywhere just so I don't have to be alone. In fact, I pay people to eat with me, okay? But... <laughs> Uh, so don't take me up on that. I'm leaving tomorrow morning early, okay? <laughs> Open your Bibles to uh, John chapter 19. John chapter 19. And I'm going to read just a few verses, and they'll, they'll be very familiar verses to you. And uh, verse, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. They gave him some vinegar to drink. He, he uttered those words, I thirst. Now there was said a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar and put it on the hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar... He said, it is finished. He bowed his head, gave up the ghost. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, 
I thank you for First Baptist Church. I thank you for her history, uh, a great history. Literally thousands of souls saved and baptized and workers sent out, not only in America, but around the world to preach the gospel. I thank you, dear Lord, for what you're doing through the present administration. Thank you for Pastor and Mrs. Howell and pray that your hand will be upon them in a special way and use them in a wonderful way. Thank you for the faithfulness of this church. They've been a testimony to churches all over the world. Thank you for them. Now, Lord, I, I, these people have been a blessing to me in so many ways through the years, and I'd, I'd sure like to be a blessing to them. But the only, only way that I could do that would be that you would bless and use me tonight. So the best I know how I commit myself to you, uh, help me to say what I need to say and help me to refrain from saying anything that I need not say. And Lord, when the service is over, when my life is over, I'll be more than happy to bend my knees and bow my head and give all the glory and honor to you because I do not deserve any of it and I don't want any of it. And I, I pray these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read a couple of other verses of Scripture. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 7 says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Notice the statement. But the end of all things is at hand. I think Peter had two things in mind. He talked a lot about the second coming of Christ. So he's saying Christ may come at any moment. And then he's saying, and you may die at any time. Uh, we don't know when. Thank God we don't know when. Amen. The Bible simply says it's a point that a man wants to die and after death judgment. So uh, death is coming. It can come at any time. First Samuel chapter 20, verses 3 and 4. Uh, the, the Bible says here, and David swore moreover and said, He's talking to uh, uh, Saul's sons. And he said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he said, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, now listen to this statement. Truly as the Lord liveth, and as my soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. It's not necessarily a good thing to think about, but bottom line is, somewhere along the line, uh, we're all going to die. The Bible says it's a point of one man wants to die, and after death, the judgment. Uh, lost people die, they go to the great white throne judgment, where they're condemned to hell for eternity. Uh, the children of God die, and we meet Jesus Christ at the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. And there we will give an account for what we've done in the flesh, whether it be good or whether it be bad. And what I'd like for us to think about tonight is the matter of finishing well. Finishing well. Let me tell you a couple of simple stories that made a great impact on me. In the early days when I was preaching down in a rural area of Kentucky, uh, one one Sunday morning, a, a little boy and his mother came out of the church, and he had on a white shirt and a bow tie. And and I, I looked at him, and I said, Anthony, you really look sharp today. And he just smiled, and he liked that. And and his mother said, you know, we were in Madisonville yesterday, and I was shopping at J.C. Penney's, and, and said, uh, Anthony came over to me. And he said, Mom, I found something I want you to buy me. And she said, okay, show me what it is. And he went over there, and he, he saw this shirt, and it had a bow tie on it. It was for little boys. And he said, uh, I want you to buy me that shirt and that bow tie. And she said, hon, why would you want that shirt and bow tie? And he said, Mom, Brother Sisk always wears a white shirt and a bow tie. And when I get big, I want to be like Brother Sisk. Brother Hal, I, I was living in a farmhouse close to the church there. And I well remember going down to the barn that day after church, after I'd eaten dinner. 
and getting on my knees and pouring out my heart to God and saying to God, Dear God, if little boys want to be like Don says, please make Don says the kind of man that little boys are to become. You know, somebody's watching you. It, it, you say, well, I'm not a preacher. I'm not, no, it doesn't make any difference. Somebody is watching you. Another one, okay, very simple story. I was at Mansfield Baptist Temple, and Al Humble was on staff there. I think at that time he was principal of the school and different things and so forth. And I'd preached for Al's dad many, many times, Brother Roy Humble. And... Uh, Al wanted to take me out to lunch, and Virginia and I were going to another church on Sunday night. And after we had eaten that day, Al followed me all the way out to my car. And before I got in, he going, of course, he's a big, tall fellow, probably about 6'5", and he dwarfs me. I look like a baby beside him, okay? But, but I never will forget, he put his arms around me, and he tears in his eyes, and he said, Brother Sisk, don't mess up. We need you. I know exactly what he was thinking. Because another man that used to go to that church quite often at Brother Humble's church, and even a few times with me, had fallen into sin. And here, here's Al. Brother says, don't mess up. We need you. Could, could I urge you tonight? It doesn't matter who you are. Somebody's watching you. And somebody needs a good example. Now, the amazing thing about Jesus was this. He could make statements like this. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and listen to it and to finish his work. See what he's saying? The thing that brings joy, the thing that brings satisfaction to my soul is to do the work that he sent me to do and to finish his work. Then he made this statement. This would be a great statement to make, wouldn't it? I do always those things that please him. Now, by the way, Jesus never exaggerated. I do always, all the time, those things that please him. You're talking about a selfless person, Jesus Christ. Again, he says, wish you not that I must be about my father's business. By the way, that were the first words that, of his that were recorded in the Bible. Now, it wasn't his first words. He was 12 years old, okay? But it's the first words that recorded. Wish you not that I must be about my father's business. You know the, the context of that story. Then again, he said, I must work the works of him that sent me. And then he made the statement, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. The words of Jesus. It, 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 you, you read all those and you, you realize. Then the Bible tells us in John chapter 19, verse 30, when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. It is finished. Now, uh, it is finished is three words in our English language. In the Greek language, uh, it's just one word, te telestai. Uh, it, it, it is a Greek word. It is an accounting term meaning paid in full. A stamp would be put on a mortgage, and it is paid in full. By the way, uh, isn't it a great blessing when you make the last payment on an automobile? <laughs> Te telesta, it is finished. Now, don't go out next week and buy another one, okay? A <laughs> uh, mortgage on a house, you know. Take to last time. It's, it's finished. The debt has been completely paid. When you, when you think about that statement, take to last time, it is finished. The price of redemption has been paid. 
For as much as you know, we're not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your father. But with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. How precious it is. Amen. As a lamb without spot and blemish. Redemption. Jesus is saying, it's finished. The price of redemption has been paid. It is paid in full. It's not partly done. Thank God it is completed work. He's saying the price for reconciliation. As sinners, we are separated from Almighty God. But when Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, then his shed blood made it possible for us to be reconciled with God. And then Paul said, we're ambassadors for Christ. We pray you in Christ that be you reconciled to God. Once we have been reconciled to God, then he said, now I've given you the ministry of reconciliation. I have given you the word of reconciliation. And you are my ambassadors. You are my representatives. I pray you in Christ did. In other words, you're speaking for Christ. That's not just for preachers. That's not just for evangelists. That's not just for missionaries. That's for every born-again child of God. When Jesus met with the disciples just before his ascension, he said unto them, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he heard those words, he was taken up into heaven. He said to every born-again child of God, you are to be a witness for me. You are to be a witness for me. It meant that the price for propitiation had been paid. First John chapter 2 says, little children, these things write on you that you sin not. By the way, that's God's goal for us. Amen? Amen? You say, well, none of us are sinless. But the longer we're saved, the less we ought to sin. We're not sinless, but we ought to sin less and less and less. Until we die, we ought to be growing in grace and knowledge of the Word of God. These things have already knew that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That's good news, amen. We have a lawyer that's sitting on the right hand of God and he's making intercession for us. Somebody's well said, if you want to go to heaven, you better get yourself a good Jewish lawyer. And his name is Jesus, amen. And then he said, he's a propitiation for our sins, believers, okay? And then he said, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. By the way, we need that message in these days. When Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, he was the propitiation. He was the sacrifice that pleased God for every man, woman, boy, and girl who had ever lived or would ever live. So don't let anybody tell you that he only died for a few people or a certain number of people. He's a prophet. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Father. For he's the Savior of all men. That we might all come to the knowledge of God through Jesus Christ. And then he said, this is to be testified. It's due time that we testify this to the rest of the world. Te telestai. Uh, an artist would finish a picture, put the final touch to it, and then he would stand back and say, Te telesta, it's finished. Uh, an artist would finish a sculpture. They'd take the last little bit off and everything. It's all touched up and so forth. Then he would step back and say, 
Okay? Cholesterol. And when Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, the last word was this. It's finished. I have done everything my Father sent me to do. I have kept the law. I have lived a sinless life. I have defeated Satan. Thank God for that. Amen. Uh, he was the impeccable Christ from the time of his birth till the time of his death. He had no sin whatsoever. Te telesta. It is finished. It is finished. Have you ever thought about what my last words would be? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we, like Jesus, could say, I've I, I finished everything God sent me to do. You say, well, Brother says that, 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 was, uh, that was Jesus, but he was not only a man, but he was God. That's right, he was, okay. In fact, he was as much God as if he had not been man. But by the same token, he was as much man as if he had not been God. He was the God-man, amen? Not 50% God and 50% man. He was the God-man. And the Bible says, We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feet of our infirmities, but was in all manners tempted as we are, yet without sin. Is that not a good thing? Yet without sin. He, he went through all the trials we go through. Yet without sin. Okay, that's Jesus. Uh, let's think for a few minutes tonight about another man that's just flesh and blood like you and me, okay? Uh, turn, your, turn your Bibles over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter chapter 4. And uh, let, let's notice a, a similar statement uh, by the Apostle Paul. In 2 Timothy chapter 4. And by the way... Uh, I, I, I love to study the life of Paul. I mean, he was one of the meanest men in the whole world. But he got saved by the grace of God. Amen. And uh, the great persecutor of the church became the great proclaimer of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now Paul is coming to the end of his life. And he writes a letter to a young preacher. And by the way, it's applicable to all of us. You know, when you read the Word of God, you ought to take it personal. Amen? I mean, it is written for you. And it's not just for you to learn, it's for you to practice. And I want you to think about uh, Paul's exhortation to a young, younger person. Many of you are young, okay? By the way, Paul was one of the most courageous men that ever lived on the face of the earth. And I've, I've read the book of Acts time after time after time. I've read his letters time after time after time. The only thing that I ever detected that Paul feared was found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And there he said, but I keep my body... And bring it into subjection. Now that, that means discipling, discipline. I keep my body and bring it into subjection. In other words, I don't let my body rule me, but I rule my body. That's not easy to do, okay? And the reason for that was, lest I become a castaway. You know what he feared? He feared that he would do something that would disqualify him for the work for which God had called him. I keep my body and bring it into subjection. That's when I preach to others. I myself should be a castaway. When you think, start thinking about it, you don't have to think very long tonight. But you can think about people that used to be used of God, but they've been put on a ship. They become a castaway. It, it's, it's like a, a car when it's no good, you put it in a junkyard. It's like a ballpoint pen when it quits writing. Best thing to do is throw it away, okay? Don't try to repair it. You'll have ink all over you and everything around you. It, a castaway. 
And that's what Paul feared. But think about Paul's desire for others. Paul's desire for Timothy and Paul's desire for you and Paul's desire for me. Now I'm going to go real quick. I'm going to read a good bit in, in, in chapter 4 here. And, and I want you, to, want you to just think about it. Number one, he said, he reminded us that we're working for God's approval. Now think about that. We are working for God's approval. I heard about a, a young preacher that became the successor of a great preacher. And he lived not too far from the church. They had a parsonage. And uh, every time the older preacher would be there, he said, I always worried. I wonder what he thought about my message. And he said, one night I was walking home from church after Sunday night. The old preacher was there that night. And I was thinking, I wonder what he thought of my message. And he said, all of a sudden, as if God spoke to me orally, he said, you ought to be worrying about what I thought about it. Huh? Uh, we preach to people, but we preach for him. So it doesn't matter what somebody else says about my preaching. I know it's not very good. But my job is to please him. Hey, singer, when you sing, it makes so much a difference what other people think about it. What does God think about it? I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead. God is watching us. And we are working for God. Isn't that a wonderful thing? I can't, can't help but think. I've had so many friends to die recently. Dr. John Halsey was my friend for well over 50 years. Uh, Dr. Ray Thompson. They died within 10 hours of each other. And I had two funerals in three days. Of two of the best friends I've ever had. Thank God they finished well. They finished well. We are working for an audience of one. And that one is Jesus Christ. Then he urged them to stay, stay with the word of God. Uh, that, that's a good thing. Listen to Preach the word. Be instant in season. Now season. Okay. Uh, stay with the word of God. When people like it, preach the word. When people don't like it, preach the word. You know, I live in Tennessee, what's called the Bible Belt. And there's probably more ignorance in the Bible Belt than anywhere in the world. And I often tell them what the Bible Belt needs is to be belted with the Bible. Amen. Hey, and by the way, that's what the world needs. That's what our churches need today. The word, the word, the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season. Out of season. Then he, then he, then he warned them that the, the day was coming when men would not adhere to sound doctrine and so forth. Now, we don't have to look and say the time is coming. No, no. It's already here. Amen. If, if you don't believe it, you listen to a lot of the junk on the television that's called preaching. Amen. And they're not preaching for God. They're preaching for themselves and they're preaching for money and they're preaching for everything else. No, no, no. Aren't we glad for churches like First Baptist Church that stays with the Word of God? Okay? So th there's a warning. Uh, then, then he exhorts us. Look, look at verse 5. I, I, I like that. But watch thou in all things. You want to finish well? Watch. Watch. Watch what you look at. Watch what you read. Watch with whom you fellowship. Watch what you listen to. By the way, those things will determine what you will become. Watch thou in all things. And then he says, endure affliction. You know, for some strange reason, Christians in America... 
feel like that once we get saved, that we're not going to have any more problems. Bottom line is, when you get saved, the problems start. Amen? I mean, uh, before you got saved, you belonged to the devil. He didn't cause you any problem at all. After you got saved, I mean, some problems began. Amen? Uh, endure affliction. In, in other words, take it patiently. Don't fuss and grumble and fight about it, but take it patiently. Endure affliction. Then he said, now look at your Bible real closely. Do the work of an evangelist. Evangelize. Evangelize. In other words, Get the gospel out. That's what evangelism means. Get the gospel out. Isn't it a shame that many times we get so busy doing so many things for God that we forget that there is a lost and dying world that's on their way to hell and we have the message that can save them, but we don't tell them. The preacher and I was traveling from a meeting one night, we stopped at a service station. It's kind of late. And after the fellow put the gas in, now that's a long time ago, okay. But uh, I took a track out of my pocket and, and I began to witness to the fellow. And he stood right there by the gas, uh, my, my gas tank there in the car. And uh, I, I was able to tell him the gospel and he bowed his head, asked Jesus to be his Savior. You know, you know what that preacher said? You hardly ever find anybody like that, do you, Brother Sid? I said, the problem is not that. We hardly ever find anybody that will tell them about it. Hey, we need to be telling the world about Jesus. Around the corner, around the world, amen. The whole world needs Jesus Christ. I never will forget when we first went to Japan. I don't know how many people would come up and say to me, Brother Rupa, you probably had something like this. But they'd say, now, teacher, Jesus is the American God. We have our own gods. And by the way, they do have their plenty of them, okay? They're everywhere. And I'd always remind them, when Jesus Christ came to the earth, there was no America. Okay. No, no, no. He's not the American God. He's not the white man's God. Uh, he's not the elite's God. He is the God of the whole world. And he died for the sins of the whole world. And everybody needs to be saved. And I've often thought, nobody is too bad to be saved. But there are some people that are too good to be saved. You say, now wait a minute, what do you mean by that? Nobody's so bad that they couldn't get saved. And usually bad people are pretty willing to admit that they're sinners. But there are so many people that think they are so good that they are not sinners and they never be saved. Nobody's too bad to be saved, but some people are too good to be saved. Then I thought, nobody's too dumb to be saved. Thank God you don't have to be very smart to trust Christ, amen? You have to be kind of dumb not to trust him, okay? But there's some people that are too smart to trust God. I was reading not too long ago about Einstein. And he was a deist. Uh, in other words, he believed that there was a God behind the whole thing. Okay? But he could not bring himself to believe in a personal God. I mean, he was too smart to be saved. Do the work. Of an imagine. I could be there on that all day, but I'll go on, okay? Then notice that he, he, he pleads with him. Endure the affliction. Do the work of advances. And then he makes a great statement. Latter part of verse 5. Make full proof of thy ministry. Make full proof of thy ministry. In other words... Be careful day after day after day to be sure that you're where God wants you to be and that you're doing what God wants you to do. Make full proof of your ministry. You say, I'm not a preacher. No, no. When you see the word minister, 
every born again child of God is a minister. Every born again child of God is a servant. We're servants, we're stewards, we're ministers. All of us need to be working for our great God. So he said, make full proof of that God. And then Paul gives us his victorious departure address. He's coming to the end, okay? Notice what he says. Verse 6, I'm now ready to be offered. I'm now ready to be offered. He's not saying they're going to martyr me. No, and they're going to cut my head. No. I'm offering myself as a sacrifice for my God. Okay. I'm now ready to be offered. Now, look carefully at this next statement. And the time of my departure is at hand. Uh, in, in those days, there was a lot of people who lived in tents, and they just pick up their tent and move from one place to another. So what he's saying was, I'm going to pick up my tent from this place, and I'm going to move it to another place. And by the way, the place he was moving to was a whole lot better than the place he moved from. <laughs> See, the child of God, the moment we breathe our last breath, the Apostle Paul made it very clear. We are absent from the body and present with the Lord. A ship takes off from one place. He's departing, but he's going to another place. So, so Paul said, the time of my departure is at hand. Then notice his farewell address here. I fought a good fight. I fought a good fight. Never will forget a good friend of mine for many, many years was a real good fundamentalist. I mean, he was right down the line. Good music, good standards, good everything. Then he got to go into some other conferences and so forth. And all of a sudden, he changed everything. Everything. I said to him, about, and he was, about, he was about 60 years old at that time. And I said to him, I said, why in the world would you make changes like that? And he said, Brother says, I just got tired of fighting. Okay, the Christian is never compared to a Boy Scout. The Christian is compared to what? A warrior, a soldier. I have fought a good fight. Now, I know a lot of people, and they call themselves fighting fundamentalists. And I guess we need some of them. I'm not sure, okay. Uh, I've, I've never really personally thought of myself as a fighting fundamentalist. Uh, I'd, I'd rather like to think of myself as a loving fundamentalist. Take me. But by the way, if you're in the battle, then there's going to come some time when you have to fight. And when we have to fight, we had better fight. And Paul said, by the way, he had a lot of battles. Place after place after place. He had to battle. In fact, somebody's well said when Paul went to a place, he didn't look for the best motel. He looked for the best jail. That's where he was going to wind up. I have fought a good fight. And then he said, I finished my course. Hey, hey notice what he said. I finished my course. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, I finished the race. I think here when he said, I finished my course, he's talking about a relay race. You know, one runner runs and then he puts the baton in somebody else's hand and then they run and then he puts it in somebody else and they run. And Paul said, I have finished my course. I run a good race. I finished my part of the course. Now he's handing off the baton to Timothy. Timothy hands it off to others. Thank God it came down to us. Amen. It's our job to hand it down to others. And we're to teach men that will be able to teach others also. I've finished the course. And then he said, I've kept the faith. By the way, faith is talking about 
is right here. Amen. The revealed word of God. If somebody tells you they have a new revelation, don't believe them. Amen. Amen. There's not any re new revelation. This is a sealed book. Okay. And by the way, there's no part of it that is not important. I heard a young a preacher not too long ago, and he actually said, let's just ditch the Old Testament. Well, you can if you want to, but you're ditching a lot of God's Word. When the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, there was no New Testament at that time. All Scripture is given by... I've kept the faith. I've kept the faith. And then he said, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, should give to me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get a crown. And by the way, he said, not just me only, but all those that love his appearing. A crown, a reward. You say, well, I, I don't think we ought to work for rewards. Well, the Bible talks about them time after time after time. Sure, we were to look for rewards. And we're not going to brag about them. We're not going to run around heaven with a crown and say, wow, look what I did. No, what we're going to do with all those crowns is one day we're going, we're going to take them and we're going to lay them down at the feet of Jesus. And we're going to say, thou art worthy. Okay? There's a crown. Then Paul did a thing that a lot of preachers don't want to do. Paul's an old man. He's in jail. And, and listen, listen to what he says. He's speaking to Timothy, okay? He said, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. You know what he did? He asked for help. By the way, don't be so proud that you will not for, ask for other people to help you. Isn't that what the church is for? Exhort one another, love one another, greet one another. You know, on and on and on. He said, Timothy, I need some help. I need some help. And then he actually puts in a regret here. These are sad words. Demas has forsaken me. Paul didn't want to lose a worker. Demas was a good man. You think about it. He had the opportunity to work with the Apostle Paul, uh, the greatest Christian leader that ever lived on the face of the earth. But one day he walked away from him. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. You know what he's saying? Demas got too close to the present world. Demas has forsaken me. I never will forget coming on home on furlough in 1968 and I had an eight year old Oldsmobile Cutlass and I lived in Chicago and it was it came from Phoenix Arizona and it didn't like Chicago it would hardly ever start you know I was preaching for Bill Kellogg in Henderson Tennessee and uh, you, you think about a Demas okay Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world one night after service, Brother Kellogg said, Hey, Brother says, tomorrow we're going to a restaurant in Evansville, just across the Ohio River there, in Henderson, between Henderson and Evansville. We're going over to Evansville. We're going to have dinner, a real nice restaurant. And uh, he said, A friend of mine runs that restaurant. And the friend of his used to be a Baptist preacher, big restaurant owner. We drove by his house and it looked like a mansion, okay? Not, nothing wrong with having a good house, okay? But it was a big, beautiful house. We got to the restaurant. We pulled in, parked beside his car. It was a brand new 1968 baby blue Coupe de Ville Cadillac. Bill and I sat down at the table. And after a while, his friend came. And I'd met his friend once before. He'd preached in our church. And he came and he sat down at the table. And I never will forget, Brother Hal. He looked at me. 
And he said, Don, I'd give anything in the world to have what you've got. You're my first thought. I wouldn't mind having some of the things you've got. <laughs> we were living in a basement apartment that somebody had fixed up for us because we didn't have enough money to pay rent. Driving that old Cutlass cut, uh, uh, Oldsmobile. Now, why would somebody that's got a big mansion, brand new automobile, big restaurant, plenty of money, say to me, by the way, I didn't have enough money to pay for that meal. I'm glad it's his restaurant, amen, he was paying. I'd give anything in the world if I had what you've got. People have always kind of wondered what happened to Demas. He might have become real rich. But I guarantee you, he was a miserable, rich person. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Then he, then he bragged on Luke. He said, only Luke is with me. That's a good thing. You know what Luke was? He was a historian, but he was also a doctor. Now, Paul had a thorn in the flesh. Everybody in the world is kind of wondering, what in the world was it? I don't know. It might have been a thorn in the flesh, okay? I, mean, I know that's too simple, but it might have been, okay? But he, he had something wrong with him, probably a physical problem of some kind. And he prayed that God would remove it. He prayed often, God remove it. But God didn't remove it. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. But guess what he did? He gave him a private physician to travel with him. Is that good for God or not? Luke is with me. Then he said, bring Mark with you. He's profitable to me for the ministry. You know what he's saying? I made a mistake about Mark. <laughs> you remember the story. Paul and Barnabas getting ready to go on a second missionary term. And uh, uh, Barnabas said, uh, hey, uh, uh, we're going to take John Mark with us again. And Paul said, no way, Jose, okay? <laughs> You're not gonna, we're not going to take Barnabas. I'm, I'm John Mark. He, he quit the first time, and, and he's no good. He, he'll never mount to anything. We're not going to take him. And so uh, that's where Independent Baptist started, you know. Paul said, you go your way, and we'll go my way, okay? <laughs> and that's all right. By the way, they didn't spend the rest of their lives fighting each other. They spread over some personality differences, but uh, they didn't call each other in the old fundamentalist, are you, and the old, uh, you, that, no. We don't find either one ever criticizing the other one. And at the end of his life, Paul said, hey, bring John Mark with you. He made good, didn't he? He wrote the Book of Mark. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that Barnabas helped him? Paul said, I made a mistake about Mark. Then he asked for some things he left behind. I, I love this statement. Any traveler has done this. And he says in verse 13, The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee. I'm always leaving something. I think somebody went out and got this tie for me today because I forgot to bring a tie tonight. I've forgotten everything. I can just see... Virginia looking down from heaven and smiling. I knew he couldn't take care of himself. <laughs> he said, the, the cloak that I left, you, you, you bring it. Then notice what he said, and bring my books. Wait a minute, Paul. You're going to be executed in a few days. What do you need with books? Until I die, I want to be learning. But then he said, especially the parchment. Now I tell people, at one time before I gave all my books to the West Coast Baptist College, I had thousands of books in my library. And I've often said, I don't judge this book by any of those books, but I judge all of those books by this book. If we're not careful, we'll get so involved in other books it's not bad. Go ahead and buy my books tonight, okay? 
So it's not bad. Books are not bad. I'm not saying that. But but let's don't don't get so excited about other books and forget the book. Then in closing, listen to it. I, I really like this. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will reward him <laughs> according to him. In other words, I'm not going to hold against it. You know, God will take care of him. Look at verse 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me. But all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that my me, the preaching, might be fully known. And that all the Gentiles might know that I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. You know what he's saying? There were place, times in my life when no man could help me, but God stood with me. Finish well. Finish well. A few days ago, I, I called a good friend of mine, Dr. Ed Nelson. Uh, he is 96 years old now, okay? And uh, what a great man of God. By the way, he started a new church in Tucson, Arizona, when he was 72 years old. Now, some of you folks that are retired, not doing anything, think about that. 72 years old, and he started a new church. But uh, we reminisce about some good things and so forth, and uh, uh, what a great man of God he has been all these years. Uh, his wife passed away last year. I think they had been married 71 years. We talked for a good while. Just before we finished our conversation, Dr. Nelson said, Don, let's pray for one another that we finish well. I kind of thought, Doc, both of us are too old to do much bad. <laughs> But here's a man, 96 years old, greatly used of God. He said, let's pray that we finish well. That's a wonderful thing to start well. I didn't have a very good start in my life. I, I, I envy people that had Christian homes to be raised in. I, I didn't have that. But in spite of the fact that you might not have started well, if you'll listen to the word of God, follow like Jesus said and like Paul said, you can finish well. Amen. A few years ago, I was preaching in Texas, and the, the name of the theme of the conference was Running Your Race. And when the pastor introduced me, he said, Now, Brother Sis has run his race. And when I got up, I said, Well, I hope he's not a prophet. If he is, I'm dead. Amen. Okay. Till I die. It is finished. Folks, one day it'll be finished. And you'll stand before God. If you're here tonight and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you don't want to die like that. If you're here tonight and a born again child of God, and you're not where God wants you to be in your Christian life. You don't want to face God to the judgment seat of Christ. It's not going to be a picnic, okay? The judgment seat of Christ. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, whether it be good or bad. Let's pray together tonight. I'm going to ask Pastor Howell to come and pray for us, and he'll conduct the invitation as God leads him. Heads bowed and your eyes closed. What a powerful truth from a servant of the Lord. Do you want to finish strong? Do you want to finish well? Just a moment the piano will play, we'll stand to our feet. Who would say Pastor Howell is
Dr. Sisk was speaking, God spoke to me. Would you pray for me as God spoke to me that I'd respond the right way? God spoke to my heart tonight. If that's you, raise your hand. We'll pray for you tonight. Amen. Amen. I want to finish strong. I want to run my course the right way. I wonder if you're here tonight and you're not sure you're on your way to heaven. Maybe you've joined us online. I wonder if you'd say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? You slip your hand up, slip back down. I'll draw no more attention to you than to anyone else. You'd say, that's me, Pastor. I would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm saved, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for the others? Lord, I pray that you'd help us to finish strong. Lord, thank you for this tremendous truth. Lord, help us to respond like we ought to. In Jesus' name. The piano's already playing. Let's stand to our feet. If the Lord's touched your heart, you need to respond. The altar's open. Wonder have I done my best for Jesus when he has done so much for me. Many coming now, you come and you respond. you've never trusted Christ, I encourage you to trust Christ. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that he came to earth, believe that he died on the cross, and that he died on the cross for your sins. Believe that he was buried and rose again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You can ask him to save you tonight, right where you're at. Maybe you're at home on a, on a couch, in a chair, in a car. You can pray right where you're at. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross and was buried and rose again the third day. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and Him alone. It's not a magic in the words. It's with the heart that man believes. Would you pray tonight if you ever trusted Christ? Would you pray and tell Him, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. He'll hear you. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. He was buried and rose again the third day. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and Him alone. Did you mean that just now when you said that? If you did, the Bible says, if you called on the name of the Lord, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you meant that, He saved you. Could I do something for you? On your screen, you'll see a, a little phone number and an email address and a website.